Hey, BioFans, it's Mr. Hajarian hanging out over here. I'm actually hanging out with Mr. Jones. Hey, guys. And Mr. Gan. So they both left, so it's just going to be uh, me doing this one. So this one's on primate evolution, so make sure you have your uh, skeleton notes with you. All right, let's get started. Hope you like the little joke I have up here for you. Oop, let's go back real quick. What's going on with this guy? Well, it's not writing. Mr. Gan, our pen's having a hard time writing. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So... Humans, apes, monkeys, and lemurs, they all belong to a group called primates. And all primates share the following. So first one is uh, manual dexterity. What does that really mean? That means that our first digit is opposable. So what it really means is that we have a thumb and we can actually grab onto things which not everybody can. Okay? Number two, we have binocular vision, which means we have forward-looking eyes. Um, and we rely so much on our vision, uh, really, when considering all of the other senses that we have. Number three, most primates are diurnal, which really means it's the opposite of nocturnal, which means that we are up during the daytime and we sleep at night rather than being awake at night and sleeping during the daytime. Okay. Uh, primates also have flattened faces, which allows for our eyes to basically both face forward. And we have unspecialized teeth, which means that we could pretty much eat anything and they're not specialized for something um, specific. Number four, locomotion. So we have flexible bodies. Uh, all primates on the ground walk on all fours except for us, for humans. Five, complex brain and behaviors. So we tend to have large brains in relation to our body size, which gives us the ability to problem solve and we exhibit social behaviors. And six, a low reproductive rate which means that we have fewer offspring than other animals. So we usually give birth to one offspring at a time, and the pregnancy ends up being pretty long, and the mom ends up taking care of the newborn for an extended period of time. So primate groups. Uh, primates are a large, diverse group. There's more than uh, 200 living, and a few terms that we have to be uh, familiar with. One of them is arboreal, one of them is terrestrial. Arboreal means that they live in trees. Terrestrial means living on land. And here are all the apes, all the following, gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. So primate ancestors. Remember we talked about common descent and, and common ancestors, so this is where this comes in. So the first primates probably lived about 85 million years ago. Thank you, Mr. Gan, who just fixed the pen. Um, when dinosaurs still were around. However, the earliest primate fossils uh, don't actually appear until about 60 million years ago. Okay. Bipedalism or bipedalism uh, is the idea of it's basically walking on uh, two instead of walking on all fours. So is it advantageous? Why did it happen? Why is it that we went from walking on all fours to walking on two? So it's not necessarily more efficient than quadrupedalism. Uh, bipedalist individuals are um, they're easier for predators to see, and it also puts a greater strain on our hips and back. So walking upright, and some of you guys know I have back issues, and part of it is because it defies gravity, and it requires more energy to walk on two than four. So some advantages. African landscape was changing uh, during the period when hominids, hominins evolved. And food sources were sparse and far apart. So by walking upright, individuals could travel long distances. Uh, we could also see food sources more easily because we were standing upright. So it was we were taller. And walking upright might have reduced the total area of the body that was exposed to sunlight. So if you check out this picture right here, notice sunlight is hitting the back of this guy basically all over. Whereas if you're walking upright, if you're bipedal, it's just hitting your head area. And one could argue that that's why we still have hair. So to continue, there's a hypothesis that suggests that bipedal hominins were able to carry objects and use their hands for other purposes. And then there's another hypothesis that suggests that an upright posture would have helped hominins reach fruit for branches that had fruit hanging in front of them, um, 
and we were you know traveling from tree to tree and we were able to hold on to this fruit. So bipedalism evolved before many other hominin traits. Remember this, very important. And it's often used to identify hominin fossils. So the earliest fossils of bipedalism are about six to seven million years old. Think about how many years ago that was. It's kind of crazy when you think about sort of where humans uh, come from as far as our ancestry. And then you look back and you're like, wow, it's millions of years. Okay, so in 1974 in Kenya, uh, there was an anthropologist, Donald Johansson, who discovered an Australopithecine skeleton. See if you can pronounce that. That helped scientists uncover more about our ancestors. And they found this. I know it looks kind of incomplete and you're like, wait, where's the rest of it? But this is one of the most complete ones that they found, and they actually named it Lucy. And it gives us so much information about our history. So the genus Homo, which includes living and extinct humans, uh, they first appeared about 3 million years ago. And at this point, the African environment was actually getting a lot cooler. Uh, a lot of scientists say that they evolved from an ancestor of the Australopithecines, which is the one we just looked at from Lucy. Homo sapiens, or excuse me, homo species had bigger brains, lighter skeletons, flatter faces, smaller teeth. Uh, they also were the first species known to control fire, which is why we have this over here, and to actually modify stones to uh, use them for tools. And as they evolved, they actually continued to develop, and they developed language and culture, which is really important when you think about human evolution. Okay, the next one we're talking about is homo ergaster. So within half a million years of the appearance of Homo habilis, another Homo species called Homo ergaster, they emerged with an even larger brain. So we look at their brain size, and it's actually pretty big. They were taller, they were lighter, uh, and they had longer legs and arms. And scientists believe that Homo ergaster actually had the first human nose, which was with their nostrils actually pointing downwards like ours. And Homo ergaster actually made... Uh, careful, I guess, hand axes. Uh, they made tools, so it was believed that they were good hunters, possibly, and then others believed that they were making these tools for scavenging. So they were using these tools to basically scrap the meat off of uh, scavenged bones. We also know that uh, there was fire that was used. Okay, so Homo erectus lived between 1.8 and 400,000 years ago. And they appear to have evolved from Homo ergaster, which uh, migrated out of Africa. Homo erectus was actually larger than Homo habilis and had a bigger brain. Uh, their teeth were also a lot more like human teeth. And it was as tall as Homo sapiens, us, and it had a longer skull. Let's see, what else do I want to tell you about this one? Um, there's evidence that, that tells us that Homo erectus actually made sophisticated hand tools, they used fire, and sometimes they lived in caves. Let's move on and talk about the Hobbit. Okay, so scientists believe that Homo erectus actually went extinct about 400,000 years ago. But there is a set of fossils that was found in 2004 uh, that showed that Homo erectus actually remained on Earth until about 12,000 years ago. So there's a huge discrepancy right there. So these fossils, excuse me, fossils represent a species called Homo florensiensis, and their nickname was the Hobbit, and this is sort of what they look like, right? You compare that to the size of a modern-day human, and you see that there's a huge difference, actually, in average height. The Hobbit was only one meter tall and um, used stone tools. So let's move on to Neanderthals. So Homo... Neanderthalensis. Uh, they actually lived in Europe and Asia about 200,000 years ago, and they were shorter than modern day humans, but they had more muscle mass, mass, as you can see. I can't even talk today for some reason. Their brains were sometimes even larger than ours. So this is sort of an example of what they looked like. So Neanderthals lived, lived near the end of the Ice Age. Um, a time where it was really cold, and when we look at their uh, remains, their skeletons, it definitely reflects a time of hardship. Their bones show fractures and arthritis, uh, and those things are pretty common when you, when you find their bones. There's also evidence that they used fire, and that they actually were building complex shelters, which is pretty cool, kind of like the homes that we build today. We know that they hunted and they skinned animals, 
uh, and it's possible that they even developed some type of basic language. There's also some evidence that shows that they cared for their sick and they buried their dead. So what does this tell you when you see this, that there's culture? Remember I talked about how important that is in our evolution. So the quite one of the questions that has come up is, are we related to Neanderthals? So in the Middle East and South Europe, Neanderthals and modern humans actually overlapped for as long as 10,000 years. And some scientists suggest that two, the two species interbred uh, because there was a skeleton found in Portugal that actually has features of both of these species. Neanderthals went extinct about 30,000 years ago, which is not that long ago. Uh, however, there is some DNA evidence, and this is something you'll have to write on the side because it's not in here. There's some DNA evidence that shows that we actually have some Neanderthal DNA in us. Okay. So we're getting close to the end, the emergence of modern humans. The species that displace Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, um, is characterized by a more slender appearance. Uh, we have thinner skeletons, rounder skulls, smaller faces. Uh, Homo sapiens first appeared in the fossil record about 195,000 years ago. And the early Homo sapiens made chipped axes and lots of sophisticated tools. And at some point, they began to migrate out of Africa. And this is when we get to the beginning of culture. So the first evidence of complex human culture appeared about 40,000 years ago in Europe, right before the Neanderthals disappeared. And unlike Neanderthals, um, early humans expressed themselves symbolically. So when you see these sort of in caves, you're like, wait, what does that mean? So they were actually trying to express themselves uh, artistically in a way. They developed uh, sophisticated weapons. They had bows, arrows. They were the first that we know of who were able to fish, who actually made clothing, and they were able to domesticate animals, which I think is pretty cool. Some call them Cro-Magnons. Uh, they represent the beginning of historic hunter-gatherer societies. And that is it for that lecture. Uh, hope you guys were able to take some good notes, and we'll be able to debrief it in class. Adios.